Well, good morning. You guys are ready to go today. I want to thank Joanne Carter for inviting me today, Jen Maurer, who worked so closely with our office on our piece of legislation. To the Coloradans that are here today, thank you for being here today. Martha Carnop and James, I don't know, Chaput? Chaput? James? I have a brother named James. And Bar Bob and Barbara Sample, welcome. Uh, welcome all of you to this insane place that you're sitting in. <laughs> you know, I, um, uh, I've got three little girls that are 11, 10, and 6, and two of them came for spring break. Uh, and I insisted the first day they were here that they go to every single meeting that I had so they could see what I did, which was a tragic mistake because <laughs> the rest of the week they went on strike. Uh, but we were sitting in, in uh, the very fancy conference room off Harry Reid's office, about six Democrats and three Republicans, getting a briefing that day on China because we were going on a trip to China. And the Commerce Department was there, and the State Department was there, and the CIA was there, and this one and that one. And all the senators were sitting on one side and the, and the briefers on the other. And... Um, about 40 minutes into it, Dick Durbin, who was sitting next to me, nudged me, and he pointed. And there was my six-year-old daughter at the other end of the room with a handmade sign reading, I am bored. <laughs> B-O-A-R-D. <laughs> so it gives you a sense of what you've walked into. Even she could detect the logjam that we're facing. Uh, here in Washington. So when I say that we need you, and I want to thank Senator Brown for being here earlier today. He was here. He's one of the great guys here. But I want to thank you for being here because we need you to provide your energy and your new ideas to what otherwise quickly is becoming a system of fairly stale debate, if you can call it debate at all. And your level your, of commitment to the American people and your advocacy will shape America's future. Poverty uh, is something I'm familiar with from the superintendency. You know, we live in a country in the 21st century, uh, in, and I live in one of the greatest cities in that country. But if you look all across the United States, uh, whether you're in an urban school district or a rural school district, today, if you're a child born into a zip code that's defined by poverty, your chances of graduating with a college degree are roughly 9 in 100, which means 91 of you will never have the benefit of a passport to our democracy or to uh, economic prosperity. And so poverty is not going away overnight either in this country or around the world, but it's going to continue to per persist here and in the poorest countries of the world. But we need to spend our time here doing more, doing much more to improve the lives of the world's impoverished. You've come at an important time. You know, as was mentioned, we're grappling over a massive deficit in debt uh, and a debt ceiling, which, by the way, is the equivalent of paying a bill we've already incurred. You're going to hear a lot of talk and chest pounding about this debt ceiling while you're here. And sometimes people will say to me, Michael, you know, my neighbor is having to uh, uh, save money to pay her bills, and you guys ought to save money there in Washington. And I say to them, you know, this is not like cutting up your credit card, this debt ceiling vote. This is like getting your cable bill or your mortgage and saying, well, I'm just not going to pay it this month. These are bills that we have already incurred. And the world and even our own markets are waiting for us to address our long-term debt problem and move beyond this silly debate. I'm encouraged that there have been some people, among them Mark Warner and Saxby Chambliss, who are willing to work in a bipartisan way to try to reduce the deficit. The President's Bipartisan Fiscal Commission uh, made some very fine recommendations. And at, at the end of the day, what I support is a comprehensive solution, one that makes responsible cuts in our yearly spending, reforms our unsustainable system of entitlements, and simplifies the tax code. I view this issue, by the way, as an advocate for our children. I was in a uh, uh, town hall not uh, far from Denver one day during the campaign, and I was talking about the moral obligation we had not to constrain our children's choices for them because of our inability to make hard choices in the face of a $15 trillion debt, and that we needed to deal with it. 
Caroline, who's with me, who is not one of the ones that came on spring break, followed me outside of this house onto the sidewalk, and she said, Daddy? And I said, what? And she said, just to be clear, she was making fun of me because I use that turn of phrase <laughs> sometimes. She said, just to be clear, I'm not paying that back, which is the right attitude for her to have, but she's not here to actually fix the problem. We need to fix the problem. But people who tell you that we can balance the budget while ignoring large swaths of our government for needed fiscal reforms are not giving you the whole story, and we need to address our long-term debt. Um, but it's only half the discussion. We also need to think about our priorities, setting goals and planning carefully on where we make our investments. I know many of you are here today to advocate for smart investments in our children. And as I said, I couldn't agree with that more. When I was superintendent in Denver, the voters made smart investments by passing groundbreaking public policy designed to increase the quality and participation in our preschool programs. In one year, we went from having 500 kids, four-year-olds, in full-day early childhood education to having over 2,000 four-year-olds in full-day education. <laughs> and De Denver has become one of the real leaders on early childhood education across this country. Similarly here, we've got to be smarter about the way we invest our foreign assistance dollars. As Congress and the President make decisions about how best to fight poverty in countries around the world, which, by the way, is still our job. Our foreign development strategy needs to be focused on providing vulnerable populations with tools that will help lead them out of poverty. And I wanted to take a few moments today to talk about one particular component of a sound international development strategy. Microfinance institutions have played an important role, in, an increasingly vital role, in helping to empower poor families around the world. These institutions enable micro-entrepreneurs to graduate from extreme poverty to sustainable livelihoods. Microfinance should be more than just credit. It's the whole toolbox of financial services, savings, insurance, skills development, business mentoring, and facilitation of producer groups. We've had real success by partnering, partnering with microfinance institutions around the world, in particular to provide financial tools to women. Women, yeah, but that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> women worldwide represent a disproportionate number of the poor. As you know, according to the UN Development Program, women making up make up 60% of the 1.4 billion people living on less than $1.25 per day. Women also lack access to the same education and health services as men. For example, as many of you know, two-thirds of the world's illiterate people are women. These disparities reflect historical second-class citizenship for women. Such historical disadvantages are pervasive and systemic. Many women and girls are trapped in the vicious cycle of poverty because of their limited access to basic financial services. Women often manage the household and produce food for the entire family, but they are unable to save money, protect against calamity, or obtain just a small loan. Simple banking tools you and I take for granted every day. One particularly effective strategy connects women with access to financial services and microfinance. Very small loans can help some women start and expand small businesses. Others need a safe place to store money as they save for school fees and health care costs. Some small business women and female heads of household want to purchase simple forms of insurance to protect against unexpected illness, which can wipe a family out. By increasing women's access to such basic financial services, we can help countless women weather unexpected storms and gain agency over their economic well-being. That's why in the coming weeks, Senator Bozeman and I will be in introducing legislation to improve the way we spend our microfinance dollars, to provide tools that empower the very poor and help them transform their own lives. Our legislation will refocus microfinance assistance in two important ways. First, it will encourage partnerships with MFIs that promote savings-led approaches. For some communities or individuals, credit is not the most effective tool, and our public policy should reflect this reality. Savings pools, on the other hand, can cushion against shock so that the poor can better manage, cope with, and recover from crisis. A savings-driven approach can also be combined with livelihood or graduation programs to help the very poor connect 
from informal banking opportunities to more formal parts of the financial sector. Second, the bill will help scale up partnerships with MFIs that provide a range of financial products, including agriculture-related pro projects. In many countries, small, smallholder farmers face unique challenges, and we need new tools to support them. Working capital for inputs, labor and production services, and long-term financing that allows a farmer to pay back a loan after the harvest. The legislation also encourages linkages to local and regional value chains so that smallholder farmers can get their crops to market. Crea and by the way, we would welcome your help on this legislation. Creating economic and financial opportunities for very poor and vulnerable populations is the right thing to do, but it is also the smart thing to do. In countries like Pakistan and Yemen, supporting women can lead to measurable progress in the economic success of families and the direction of tomorrow's youth. In Latin America, microfinance institutions help strengthen and diversify economies. In sub-Saharan Africa, these efforts can help small-scale subsistence farmers prevent future food crises and stabilize struggling democracies. I look forward to working with all of you in the coming weeks and months, and I appreciate all of your efforts to serve others and to focus on the least among us. It not only helps them, it makes us a better country. Thank you for being here today, and thank you for having me. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.